Welcome to the Ad Nauseum Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff. Welcome to Ad Nauseum, episode 69. It's a uh, it's a chilly evening here, isn't it, Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle? It's chilly outside and in here. It's chilly in here? It is, yeah. So my name is Dr. David C. Noe, just like it was last time, and uh, this is the Ad Nauseum podcast where we give classical gourmands what? Everything they could ever hope for. Everything they could ever hope yes, for. Yes, yeah. Tasty dishes, morsels. T- served up. Yep. Appetizers. Entrees, a little bit of dessert thrown in at the end. Yep, yep, okay. yep. Nice and hot, unlike the vomitorium right That's at this right. present moment. Yeah. And uh, so you're doing well? I'm doing well. Okay. I'm doing good. I'm enjoying that. I'm, uh, I'm on a, a holiday break here. A little bit of a break. Yeah, and so the... it's been nice just kind of mm-hmm. hanging out at home. And... It's a big bag of Twizzlers. Yeah, oh man, on the, on the couch. Keeping the fiber high. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> so Jeff, uh, we got to get to a shout out, but what's the theme? What's the, what's the topic tonight? We're talking about uh, children's uh, books in Latin. Children's books in Latin. Yep. With a little bit of, uh, I know, I think this will probably come out. Post Christmas, yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit after Christmas. But with a little bit of a holiday theme, we're going to be mm-hmm. looking at the Doctor Seuss's famous uh, Grinch story right. in Latin. Yes, but so we're also talking broadly about uh, uh, children's books in Latin um, broadly. Right? Yeah, we got a big stack of book he- books here. We have everything from uh, Winnie Illapu mm-hmm. to a couple of J.K. Rowling titles. Yep. Uh, to Walter Conus in Flatus. What? Stay, stay tuned. Scandalous. If you want to know what that one means, <laughs> we've got some Charlotte's Web. Uh, we really are running the gamut, aren't we? We are. We are. Where we hope to dip a little bit into each of them and, mm-hmm. and uh, see what we think. All right. Yep. So our shout out. You got, why don't you take the shout out? This yeah. So today? this is from an old friend, uh, Elizabeth Lane, and uh, Elizabeth lives in uh, Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, my family and I have known Elizabeth and her family for more than twenty years. Wow. And uh, she writes, "My classics education, if you can call it that." consisted of two years of Latin in high school, Hmm. the most memorable part of which was a, quote, Roman banquet in which we first-year students got to be slaves clad in burlap sacks. Is that historically accurate? I don't think so. (laughs) And uh, cook dinner for and serve the older students and parents before being sold at auction. So they had to make a dinner and then get sold? That is brutal. That's brutal. Yeah, I think burlap was uh, invented by Sir Edmund Burlap (laughs) in the early 1820s. Right, right, right. Um, Mostly for storing potatoes. (laughs) Exactly right, exactly right. So they're 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 fudging the. They uh, took some liberties. Yeah, right, right. But Elizabeth says currently I am a suburban homeschooling mom who likes to read everything from Jane Austen and David McCullough. Mm. You know David McCullough, I do. I, American I, I, historian. Yes, I've read a number of his books and like them very much. Yeah. Very nice uh, biography on John Adams. Yeah, that's one of them. I'm not one mistaken. I've read. Yep. Uh, she also likes cookbooks and juvenile fiction. My own shout out, clever Elizabeth. Listen how she's sneaking this in here. What, what's this? What do we got here? My own shout out to Gary D. Schmidt, whom I first learned about from our podcast. Fabulous. Yeah. Excellent. We're opening doors. It's like a podcast within a podcast within a podcast. (laughs) Like one of those Russian dolls. I knew you were going there. (laughs) She says, I first heard about ad nauseum from Tara Noe, who would be my wife, who sent sent me a link to the Susan Wise Bauer episode because it related to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Not having a passion for the classics may make me an atypical listener. But I think almost anything can be interesting if it is well presented and presented. Oh, that's ironic. I flubbed that. <laughs> and the Ad Nauseum podcast does that. I have been noticing and understanding more classical references in what I read. Oh, man, that's so great to hear that um, you know, someone who you know, two two years of high school Latin right. only remembered the burlap auction. Yeah. What a and, miserable way to remember Latin. <laughs> but still but still likes the podcast, still is finding stuff. Uh, worthwhile and, yes. and fun, and um, she's a fan. Yeah, we're so grateful. So thanks, Elizabeth, for listening and uh, putting up with our antics each week. Yes. We're really grateful for that. Yeah. Now, Jeff, you have the Ope quote. I do have the Ope quote. Um, and um, I, it, uh, an interesting choice for an Ope quote. I'm sensing some hesitation. I am, yes. But um, So it, just a reminder to the viewer and, and the uh, and the listener that the opening quote isn't always something that we necessarily agree with. Right. It's, it's, to, it's to start the conversation. Right. Just like on the, the Twitter, right? On the Twitter. On the Twitter, they say uh, retweets do not equal endorsements. Exactly. The Ope quote does not equal an endorsement. Exactly right. So um, there's the caveat here. So this comes from uh, a certain Mark Walker 
who translated. I don't. Do you know the year this came out? It's fairly recent. Isn't um, it? It's a decade. It's a decade. Oh, it's now. that old already. Yeah, I wish it were longer. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, a Latin translation of Tolkien's The Hobbit, right? right? Uh, which he entitled Hobbitus Illa. I, I already have a problem with that. We, we'll, I, we'll deal with that later. Yeah. Um, but he. This comes from his introduction. Okay. And we'll see how this plays out. All right. So he writes: There is, as anyone who has taken the trouble to study Latin knows, a curious gap in the available reading material. On the one hand are simplified stories for classroom use, on the other the glories of high Latin literature, but remarkably little in between. What is there for the intermediate reader who is tired of the textbook but not quite ready to grapple with the stately poetry of Virgil or the grand rhetoric of Cicero? Quite a lot, I would say. There is quite a lot, (laughs) but it's still a decent question. It is, it is. I'm with Mr. Walker thus far. Thus far, okay, all right. He goes on. What for the accomplished reader who wants to escape from ancient Rome's marbled halls from time to time? Boo. Now he lost me. Really? That that did it? The marbled halls? Well, what's wrong with the marbled halls of ancient Rome? Well, he's, he's not saying anything's wrong. He's just, if you want to like step out into the alley every once in okay, a while. Okay. All right. right. Okay. For a smoke? Is that what so, you're saying? Something like that. Or, or Twizzler. Apuleius. Right. <laughs> what for the reader who wants to just read Latin, the very idea for fun? This is where the Latin Hobbit comes in. It is nothing more or less than a novel, but a novel now in Latin. Which is to say, it is a Latin text whose principal aim is to be read solely for the pleasure of reading, not one to be studied with the aid of copious editorial notes or labored over in order to glean hard-won quotations for an essay assignment. Reading for pleasure is a rare experience for Latinists. True? No. No. Who, in my opinion, deserve to enjoy themselves as much as anyone else. Mm. Well, he set up a bit of a false dichotomy, mm-hmm. right? He set up the, on the one hand, there are those who really can't read Latin for pleasure because they need copious notes and stacks of editorial helps and translations and so forth. They can't read for pleasure. Yeah. Uh, and there are people who really can, as difficult as it may seem. Mm-hmm. So that's on the one side. And then on the other side is those who can, you know, just um, read because they want to. And he's trying to hit that mark. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was interesting because as I was thinking about this, and I, I admit, I don't know a ton about the 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 Latin books uh, mm-hmm. for, for kids, um, right. but it struck me is that it would tend to kind of fall into two camps. And one, it would be used as a classroom thing to kind mm-hmm. of to further a student's knowledge, or two, it's kind of gimmicky. Yes, right? it's something that somebody might have in their shelf but never open yes. and have it for the novelty of it. And he seems to be seems to be striking at a kind of a third way that um, no, this is Latin. You can read not because you're a student and right. not because it's a gimmick, just because it's for fun. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that's interesting in and of itself, though I disagree with a lot of what he's saying here. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good way to start. That's a good way to launch us into this particular episode. Yeah. And what we'll find when we get a little bit further down the road later in the hour, uh, or the two or three or four hours that this episode <laughs> takes. You got any plans this evening? No, I'm not, I'm not going You're anywhere. You're here for the long haul. big time. Uh, yeah. Is that the, the quality of Latin and the variety of offerings uh, is pretty great, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The quality of Latin is great? No, I'm, I'm trying to say... The Latin varies in quality considerably yeah. in, in this particular genre of kids' books okay, and okay. translations, um, and you know, they're all over the map. Yeah. All right. So, so what are we giving the, uh, the audience today? Well, we're going to give them um, a close look in the first portion of the show, before the ads, at uh, Quomodo Invidiosulis Nomine Grinchus Christi Natalem Abrogavarit. Ah. Which is uh, how a certain meanie in Udiosilis named Grinch stole Christmas. Oh, okay. So I'm going to be reading a little bit of the Latin, and uh, Jeff's going to be reading for us uh, some of the English translation. We'll yes. just talk about some of the choices made uh, yeah. by Terence Tunberg, Terence and Jennifer Tunberg. Uh, who are the translators of this brilliant kids' book? So, um, just from that adjective, yes. um, we were talking uh, just be- just before the show. Um, you think this is very good Latin? This is superb, superb Latin. And in fact, yeah. this book, um, I understand, has sold extraordinarily well mm-hmm. for Bocchesi Carducci, which are the publishers. Who is the publisher? Uh, Wakanda, Illinois, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it has sold really, really well, primarily because people see right. This is how the Grinch stole Christmas. I know that story. I love that story. I love those illustrations. And then they buy it and they think, because it's a kid's book, the Latin must be correspondingly easy, yeah. which is not true at all. No, and my sense is that that's um, that th- that's the same case for actually for a number of these books. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's very difficult to translate some of these ideas uh, into another language, right? Especially the more idiosyncratic and peculiar an author is. Right. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is going too far afield, but I went through a stage where I read a bunch of Russian literature, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed it quite a bit. 
Um, but I was told by those who know, you, you can't read Dostoevsky or some of these others and really appreciate the the genius of what they've done unless you read Russian. Yeah. Which I've under, which I understand is incredibly difficult to learn. I, I, that's my understanding as well. But I think that's that's a general truth for for any everything. Well, I think there's always a loss, right? For sure, there's a loss. But I'm yeah. I'm thinking that it it might be greater in some languages than others, hmm. right? So I can read some things in Spanish, not especially well, but I, I think I can kind of catch a little bit of it. Yeah. Uh, to go to something like Russian, ooh. I think it probably has a lot to do with kind of the cultural distance as yes, well, right? for sure. Right. So, I mean, reading something translated, say, uh, into English from Japanese. Oh, yeah. There's got to be, that's got to be extraordinarily more difficult than going from, you know, one romance language to another. Yes, that's yeah. a good point. Okay. So yeah. maybe the reason that I found the, the Spanish easy is because it's a romance language, right? Yeah. It's uh, so similar to Latin. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you sometime about if you have a favorite translator of Dostoevsky, because I, I, <laughs> yeah. I went through a similar phase. But, I think uh, the name is Magershack. Really? Magershack okay. is the one. And I, I love those novels. They're just riveting. And there are classical elements in there, too. The femme, oh, without a doubt. The femme fatale. Sure. Uh, but um, I was told, look, you're, you're really not getting anything of the author's poetry and beauty and style, because it's in English. Right? So did you run out and pick up a uh, can, uh, teach yourself Russian? No. No, it didn't go <laughs> No, I was daunted. <laughs> yeah, I, no I was pretty much turned away. So we'll hold this up here. This is the this is the book. You can see it, viewer. Komodo in widioslus nomene grinches Christi natalam abrogaverit. How a meanie, a little meanie, mm-hmm. in widioslus. That's a diminutive, right? And uh, in widio means to envy. Yes. Right. In widio means to cast the evil the eye. The evil eye. Yes. Someone to envy them. Right. Yeah. And so this is a great way to translate the word Grinch. Right. I, you know, I was actually wondering about that because mm-hmm. I looked at that title and um, and uh, I want to ask you, in Widios Ocelus, why do you think that's necessary here? Why not just nomine grinkus? Well, because the word grinkus or grinchus doesn't mean, mean anything. anything. So you need that extra, extra well, thing to unpack that. Every translation is an interpretation. Mm-hmm. And I would say this is a particularly sophisticated and accurate one. Okay. He could have left it out. I mean, uh, Terrence and, and Jennifer, they could have left it out and just said, you know, Komodo grinchus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christina Talama Broga Weirit. Uh, but I think the Inwidiosilus, it's descriptive. Okay. And if anyone has ever looked at early modern works in Latin, I'm talking about things from the 16th and 17th centuries. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're primarily theology written by Protestants and Catholics alike. The titles are enormous in length mm. and they're highly descriptive. Okay. You remember when we made fun of de rerum natura, right? Of course. The nature of things. Yes. Right? <laughs> That's a relatively short title. I yeah. Mean, it's, an, it's an incredibly short title. These early modern titles, they can be literally 20 to 30 words in length. So, you're, the, so uh, t- the Thunbergs are yes. kind of, they're taking their cue from that. I, that well, era. I don't know if they are okay. exactly, although they're, you know, they're uh, scholars of the Renaissance. Um, they know Neo Latin extraordinarily well. Yeah. I just mean more along the lines of. This is not an unusual title, right? Right. They, they tend to be very descriptive in Latin. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is one of the reasons that I like Latin titles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to know what's in there. Yeah. Right? That's a really interesting point. Um, I think that, uh, I think a trap that uh, I think many students and certainly myself fall into is we tend to treat this, the, lang- the, the Latin language as kind of this monolith, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, that's you know, thousands of years old and lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. Um, and kind of treat it as if, as if it never changes, right. right? And so, I mean, one of the questions I, I, I you know, I was, if I thought about like approaching a project like this, you know, would you pick an era? Would you, you know, would you pick a kind of a style of Latin right. from an era to, or are you just kind of using a dictionary right. and trying to render the the best meaning for you know whatever you're trying to say? Yes, which you certainly can't do word by word. You have to do it according to sense. Yes, which is what we'll see in just a minute. Okay, for sure, great. So we've got the title. Then there is this subtitle, mm-hmm. right? Qui labellus est a doctora sus primo anglicae compositus, right? Uh, a little book which was first written in English, compositus primo anglicae by Dr. Seuss. Seuss. And then I love this other little subtitle, which what is we, added by there? the Thunbergs. Yeah. At nunc quod vix credas in sermonem latinum a Guinevere Thunberg iuante terentio Thunberg conversus. And now you can hardly believe it. <laughs> Quote weeks credas, translated conversus into the Latin language by Jennifer Tunberg with some help from Terence Tunberg. Excellent. Now, my only change there, I might have, instead of the quote weeks credas, uh, maybe put a mirabile dictu. Yeah, yeah, a mirabile dictu. Yeah, yeah. Amazing yeah. to say. Right. But you know, they're humble. Yes. Right. So they're right. not going to say, <laughs> yeah, we've done something extraordinary, but they really have. Yeah. They yeah. have really done something that is uh, 
it's incredible. Excellent. All right, so we want to read a little bit. Yeah, let's read a little okay. bit. I got the I got my English translation. All right, I got the the classic Seuss. Uh, version here. So you got the easy job, you might say. Yes, exactly. You but get... of course, people have high expectations for you because they've heard this. But they've heard? They've heard the English version so many times. Well, okay. So there's a lot of pressure. Well, on me there is it. some <laughs> pressure, right? If I mess up the Latin, which I no doubt will at some point, who's okay. going to notice? All right, right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so should we start with the Latin? Let's do it. Okay. Laituli, Laitopoli, Florentes, Festo Christi, Nataliquio, Walde Delectati Sunt Omnes Ad Unum. So uh, every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. That's it. That's all I got there. I mean, okay. Is it, right? I mean, is it, I mean, is it? No. So how's this? Is this, a, is this a one-to-one? We no, it's do not. It okay. We have the Lightopoli, Lightuli, the happy little people. So those are the who's. That's right, because Lightos is the adjective Lightos um that means happy, mm-hmm. right? And then there's the verb Lightor Lightari to rejoice. Yeah. It's in uh, the the Orberg text, the great LLPSI. So the Lightuli, Lightopoli Florentes. The ones who are doing well, they're flourishing. One of my favorite words is, yes. you know, Florentes down in Whoville, Lytopoli. Lytopoli. Happy town. Right, right, right. Happy town. That's it. It's an interesting choice. Yes. All right. So and rather than using some form of qui quote, quote, right. the who's, yes. th- I mean, that wouldn't work. No. No, no. So you have to choose something. You got to choose something that captures the meaning, right? Yeah. You're not translating word by word. Right. I think it gets it, right? I think it really gets it. Festo Christi Natalicio, Walde de Delectati sunt omnes. Mm-hmm. So all of them were thrilled, delectati sunt omnes, while they delectati. They were very thrilled, Festo Christi Natalicio, by the, you know, the birth festival, right, the holiday of Christ, mm-hmm. Christmas, all down to a man, ad unum, right, right down to the last person. Gotcha. All right. So every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. That's right. I, 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 I noticed a kind of a bit of an irony here. Okay. Um, one is that you know, we, I think we've talked on the on this show about how um, Latin compared to English is a much more efficient language. Yes, here we go. Right. <laughs> so, Dr. Seuss in this case is a lot more efficient than the Thunbergs. Uh, yes. Right. And well, that's because it was written in English first. Okay. That's the key. Okay. I got you. So if you're going back the other way. Right. And okay. also think about how unusual Seuss's opening sentence is. Every who down in Whoville. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You experienced anything like that in English conversation? Very rarely. It's unusual, it isn't is. it? Right, right. So yeah. had it originally been written in Latin, it would presumably be more compact. Right, 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 right. But now that we have to go from a, a dense English meaning, a deceptively simple English meaning, into Latin... It takes a little bit of effort, right? So it, it, I also note that the the um, uh, the translators here have chosen one not to attempt the iambics. Of no, Seuss not here. And oh, and they've discarded the rhyme. Yes. So they're really going after trying to. We're going to find Latin to really kind of tease out the sense Correct. of what Seuss is saying. Yes. So okay. I would liken it to, um, I would liken it to what happened in the uh, Renaissance, early modern period. Um, I like to, you know, I teach some Homer. And uh, when I'm studying, say, the Iliad, mm-hmm. as, I, as I have been doing recently, I often like to look at Latin translations uh, from the early modern period because it, it's easier than just looking at an English translation. It gives me more joy. It's also not cheating in the same way. Hmm. So yeah. there was a man named Samuel Clark, and he translated all of the Iliad into Latin because he had been hired to teach the, you know, the son of some prince. And, of course, the, the, to teach him Greek. Now, the son knew Latin but didn't know Greek. So Clark said, well, I'll just translate the Iliad into Latin. Just quick a sec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, not all of his choices are, you know, ones I would have made. Um, but it's, it's similar to this, right? It's not a verse translation. It's here's what, here's what it means in the best Latin that I can put together. What what year are we talking? What era? Um, this is uh, early 18th century. I okay. think 1720s or wow. so. Early 18th century. And this text is is uh, oh yeah is available. And yeah, we should it, probably talk about it sometime. It sounds really interesting. There are actually, dozens of those that have survived. Really? Yes. Okay. Quite quite uh, quite common. Should we go on? Please. All right. Uh, you want to do the English first? I'll do the English first. All right. And uh, and I can just at a glance, it's we're going to have a similar kind of issue with lots of Latin. Okay. In okay. Uh, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. That's it? That's it. Okay, here we right. go. At pro dolor, in loco haud longe laetopoli, ad septentrione sito habitabat, in widiosulus quidam, nomine Grinchus, qui festum illud omni noe ha menterque respuebat. And that 
that correlates to those those short three lines I just yes. read. Yes. Okay. Is that all right? That's, no, that, that's a problem fine. with that. That's fine. You know, I I I I, I mean, I still love re- reading Doctor Seuss. Even at my my children, even yes. if they're older, they, they will request it. Um, um, and it's so much fun to read with the rhymes and the rhythm. It right? is. So it's. Um, You're saying this has sucked the fun out of it. I'm not saying. No, I'm not saying that at all. It's just it's so radically different. It is different. Yeah. Yep. We can go on later in this episode to Catus Petasatus, which does do the rhymes and the yes, the ambics. it does. Yes. Yep. Yes, and yeah. it also is brilliant. Or, uh, Wirent Owa, Wirent Perna, right? The eggs are green. The, the ham, ham is, is green. green. <laughs> Green eggs and ham. That's also written in brilliant, um, translated in brilliant iambics by the Tunbergs. Oh, the same, same, uh, oh, same yeah. crew. Oh, okay. They, they are, awesome. They're fantastic. Yeah. Shall I give a little more lengthy, prosy translation of what we have Yeah, here? would you? Yeah, so yes. the ot pro dolor. Well, ouch, that's terrible. <laughs> um, in a place that's not too far from, uh, Lytopoli, right? In a place not too far from Whoville, uh, situated to the north, mm-hmm. ad septentriones, uh, there was living, habitabat, um, a certain greedy, envious, nasty individual. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the Grinch, not my co-host. <laughs> Inwidiosilus, nomine Grinchus, who respuebat, who rejected or spit out, who spit out that uh, holiday, festum illud, omnino vehementerque. He spit it out entirely and with great prejudice. Excellent. Excellent. So that is not a very... <laughs> <laughs> memorable flowing English translation. Right, right, right. right. It does capture the meaning, though, in, uh, incredibly well. Yeah, and I'm thinking that, um, you know, I don't know how many Latin teachers have might have used this text in class, but I think this would be oh, a great exercise. It would, right? but they're in for a they're in for a nasty surprise. It, they are, but I mean, if they if they read the very well known Seuss yes. version and they have a sense of what it means, and then to go to that and unpack it, you've already got kind of a head start. Right. right. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so it, it makes what's, you know, very sophisticated in some of his difficult Latin oh, it is. a little bit easier to approach. Right. Well, right. when I first picked this up 20 years ago, you know, I was just about finishing my PhD. So compared to people who don't know any Latin, I knew a lot. Yeah. I didn't really know enough to read this comfortably. I mean, this was challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was in for that kind of a surprise, right. you know, which is... Um, Oh, it's going to be Seuss level Latin. No, yeah. no, no. It's sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. Yep. How about we have a little more of the English? Okay. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Ah. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Yeah, here we I, go. I see a chunk coming. Uh, it is okay. nine lines. Oh, man. Okay. Non tantum die sipsa sedetiam tempora omnia quae Christi natalem, aut ante cedebant, aut sequebantur, in wudiosulo nostro odio erdrant maximo. That's the first sentence. Wow. Aga nunca mabo, no lime erdrogarda, quadra grinchus, ili tala, ille tale modo se geserit. Nemo precerto consuetudinis eis causam skit, for tasa mentis haud omnino erdrat compos. Perhaps he was entirely crazy. So that's that's that. Perhaps for Tassa, calcea mentis vexabatur angustissimis. Oh, there's the tight shoes, right? That's right. Yeah. Maybe he was being harassed by his extraordinarily tight sneakers. <laughs> Quibus pedes eus crudeliter cruciabantur, uh, by which his feet, here's a really prosaic translation, forgive me, mm-hmm. not, not the Latin, but mine, yep. by which his feet were cruelly being tortured. <laughs> Sounds like a, a Latin high school exercise, right? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I like it. No, not not Tunberg, but my my yeah. rendition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quis skiat? Who, Who knows? knows? Said Nisi follower, but if I'm not mistaken, what a simile est in Uriosla nostro cor fuissa plumbeum. So what do we got there? So that's that's the two two sizes too small. Well, yeah, that's right. the. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, his heart, yeah, the heart that belonged to our Grinch in Wittioslo Nostro was very much like where is simile plumbeum. Plumbeum. I can't remember now. I'll have to check after if it's plumbeum or plumbeum. I think it's. I'm going to go with plumbeum. Okay. What's what's the difference there? Well, it's just the quantity of the penultimate syllable. Okay. Uh, it, that is, if I'm pronouncing it. Oh, correctly. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha, you right. So, uh, but it means lead. Lead. Right? So he's it's, got a lead heart. That's right. Yeah. He's, maybe he's got a head, uh, uh, a heart that's just like lead. Lead. Oh, that's so interesting. It's a great translation. It really is. It really, really nicely captures the idea. <laughs> But it's it's not English, obviously. Right, right. Should we take a couple more pages? Let's do a couple more pages. All right. This is, this is, this is interesting. All right. 
But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm-lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. That's it? That's it. You're done. I'm done. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, take it out. Sad. Ut ut recipsa se se habeba, si we corda aigro si we calcea mentis in wirioslos magis afflictabatur, domi Christi natalis pridie, manebat inimicitia erga laichulos in cancus, e spelunca tenebrosa in qua domicilium habebat exile, in wirioslos noster fronte maletiose contracta laetopolum infra sitam conspexit. Ubi splendebant multi fenestrae lucernis lucentibus luminatae, sat bene intellexit grinchus noster omnes illic laichulos, insertis whisky suspendendis tunc diligenter ac sedulo versari. Wow. Yeah. Mm. It takes a lot of Latin to capture some of these dense ideas, uh, especially since the, I would say, the vocabulary being used here by um, Seuss is not the most common Latin no. vocabulary. No, he's, he's constantly... Um, making up new words. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Right. So how do you how do you do this? Right. Uh, Rife with neologisms. Right. So you have to have what are called um, circumlocutions, right? Or yep. a paraphrases. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, uh, a roundabout way of describing something. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think this the fact that it takes so much Latin here to kind of unpack these ideas, I think, is a testament to kind of Seuss's genius. I agree right? with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like. We'll just look at a couple lines okay. here, but. Espe lunca tenebrosa, from his shadow cramped lair, his cave, Espe lunca tenebrosa, in which he was carrying out his domicilium exile, right? Uh, our Grinch, in Wirioslus Noster, now we have an ablative of description, fronte contracta, with his forehead, uh, his brow furrowed, yeah. but it's furrowed malitiose, right? A nice adverb that means. Uh, what, f- filled with malice or... W- wickedly? Wickedly, yeah. right. He looked down upon Whoville, right? Like Topolum conspakes it. Then we have where the many windows were gleaming and they were illuminated with their shining lanterns, Lucernis, uh, Lucentibus, and Satbeni Intellex, Grinchus Noster, etc. Yeah, what, is, what, do they, what does they do for mistletoe? Uh, uh, mistletoe is insertis whisky suspendendis. Okay, okay. Which is good. Yeah, right? it's, it's, the woven. That's the, right. right. Yep, the woven. Um, the, that's the wreath, right? Yeah, and the whiskus is the particular ivy or herb ivy. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. hangs down and yeah. it's suspendendis hanging there. And he didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't like it. He didn't like, <laughs> he it. like it at all. No, he did not. <laughs> Boy, yeah. We, we never get kind of a backstory, do we? we never to the of, Grinch? Like, you know, how the Grinch became the Grinch? Right? Well, you know, how he Mike Myers cave? tried, right? And there were some terrible movies and I, I heard terrible books. Like, yeah. I haven't seen any of them. Have you seen any of them? No, no. And uh, I've tried to steer my children away from I them. I think yeah. that's wise because some things just don't translate to the screen. No, no, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to think um, of, uh, I mean, there have been lots of, of kind of translations of Seuss to the screen um, and yeah, some of them, some of them hit, but I think a lot of them just can't capture no, the unique. It's special. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Respect the, the boundaries of the genre. Should we have another page? One more page. Yes. All right. page, uh, so. Now maybe we ought to pause, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, and I, I think that we had some Christmas music at the beginning of this episode. Yes. Uh, by the fabulous Mr. Jeff Sheets. Yes. Who provided some great Christmas music for us a couple of episodes ago. I remember. But the the listener, the viewer might be thinking... What? Christmas is over. Why are they doing this? Yeah. I Lame. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, <they're> probably <laughs> thinking that. But isn't it, uh, I mean, we're just trying to milk this, aren't we? We are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. May- maybe the Grinch stole your Christmas a little bit. Uh, no, I don't mean yours. Yes. Yours was all filled with Twizzlers and Asterix and. It, it's right. It was and so forth. Yes, exactly. It, it was. Uh, it was magical. It was magical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we recognize that you know, for, right. no, not for everybody. Right. Yeah. So this is to help you bring you back down to earth a little bit. Gotcha. I like. I like that. Okay. Right. Let's move on. Then. All right. And they're hanging their stockings. He snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow's Christmas is practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers, nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. You done? Uh, well, there's a little bit that kind of. Oh, uh, okay. It's, it's the next page. Let's, oh, oh, wait, wait. All right. Okay, so we have Tum fremens in Wiriosulus, e mihi inquit tibialia suspendunt, cras certo certius Christina talas adueniat, fere yamad est. 
So then the Grinch growling fremens. Mm -hmm. So this is the same word that you can use of a lion, right? Le oh, yeah. Leo fremit, to roar, to grumble, to growl. It's an animal sound. Yes. Each of the animals in Latin, you know, make their own sound. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So lupus, what does the wolf say? Ululat. Ul he, he ululates. He, yes, the yeah. wolf howls. Yeah. And the sheep, the oas, balat. Is that Balo really? That, yes. That's a Latin? Uh, yes, it's really? a Latin. You think I'm just making this up? Maybe a little no, bit. No, no, no. <laughs> and the sheep bleats and the dog, the conus. Yeah. Conus latrot. Latrot. Okay, bow, that. bow. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Roman dogs said bow, bow, right? Bow, bow. English dogs say woof, woof. Right. I've never heard dogs say bow, wow. You have never heard them say bow, wow? No. Well, the Roman dogs were smarter, I guess. <laughs> they say bow, bow. They, they would enunciate. Yeah, okay. so ovis balat, canis latra, mm -hmm. uh, bos, the, right? the, the cow. Muget. Muget, yeah, okay. The cow moves, moves. muget. Right. It's just right there. Uh, the awis, uh, pipiat, yeah. chirps. Pip, pip. Yep, and uh, the Grinch, fremit. Fremit. Yeah. He says to himself, I mihi inquit tibialio suspendunt. They are hanging their stockings. So tibialia, stocking? tibialia, right. right. So if you think anatomically for a moment, uh -huh. this shouldn't get messy. The bone in the lower leg is the tibia. The tibia, right? Yep. It's also the Latin word for flute. Right. That's what I, think. I saw that too. That they're right. hanging their little flutes. No, well, they're they're socks, okay. right? The right. thing that covers up, you know, the lower part. Cross tomorrow. Kerto kertius. More certain than certain, Christmas will come. Christi Natalis Adwenia. In fact, it's almost here. Fere Yamadest. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't like it. He does not like no, it. He's he so not. unhappy. That's right. Can yeah. you read just a little bit here before we turn the page? Uh, oh yes. For tomorrow he knew. Yes, and that has been rendered by the Tunbergs brilliantly. Nam agnoerat grincus ille. For that Grinch, he knew. He knew. And then we turn the page. Oh, we got to do, so, do a little bit more here. Here we go. This is oh, good. It's getting wild, isn't it? All right. Now we're down <laughs> in Whoville. He knew all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise, oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise. This is, you know, this is something that I have in common with the Grinch. In my yeah, house. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's yeah. chaos. Isn't yes, it? it is. I'm feeling very Grinchy. Have you put on your Christmas list uh, Bose noise? No, how, how would I the say the noise this? canceling headphones? Nose canceling headphones. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, I'm. I do have a set of those. You do? Yes, but I, I constantly leave them in my office. Oh, nice job! So, so they don't don't do any good. So the noise is not all canceled. And the times I've had them home, I, I slip those on. It doesn't make my wife very happy because <laughs> she's the one who has to deal with it. She's everything. left with all the noise. She now, is. What's on the banner at the top of this oh, page? Oh, it says Mary Mary uh, in the Seuss, in the English translation. Yes, and yes. in the Latin we have Lightomini Lightomini. Ah. Uh, Which is a, you ready for this? Yes. It's a second plural, present imperative passive from the deponent verb litor litari. So it translates actively. As? As be rejoice, happy. Rejoice, rejoice. Be happy, be happy. As you would in litopoli. That's right. Yeah. So uh, this is a good illustration here of an important point. The English idiom is to use an abstract noun or I guess an adjective here, which is just describing what people should feel like. Right. right. Merry, Merry. When we say Merry Christmas, we're saying be Merry exactly. this Christmas. Right. right. The Latin uses a completely different idiom. It uses an imperative. Mm -hmm. So students are often asking me how to say things in English. How do I say, um, how to say things in Latin? How do I say surprise, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't just pick a, a one Latin word that maybe means surprise because you have to have the context. Well, you know, what is it saying? It means... Here I am, I'm shocking you, you didn't expect this. Yes. Something like that. <laughs> Which is so, what... What would you do there? I mean, would it for be... For the word surprise? Would it be like an imperative? Like, you know, hey, be shocked? Uh, it would be something like, um, look out, kawe, maybe. Kawe. Right? Surprise. Or kawete, right? Right. Beware, or something. I so don't know. So if you were throwing like a surprise birthday party, the, guy, the poor schmuck walks in the door, you, you're popping out and you'd yell, kawe? Maybe. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> look out. <laughs> I, but it's yeah as a you know as a student of latin it's a difficult question yeah because the idiom is so different it is i i find that kind of stuff endlessly fascinating i think like, to really love a language and learn a language that stuff has to interest you right? yes oh sure right and so you don't want to just you're not just going and thinking okay surprise i'm going in the, in the dictionary what's the noun for yeah. it? so the, the word admiratio mm. could be translated as surprise yeah it's, it's a feeling of shock but you wouldn't put that on a banner no. right? or shout that at someone because it's a noun. <laughs> it's an abstract noun. It's like shouting dignity or something. 
<laughs> it's just not going to fit. Right, 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 right. Uh, because what does surprise even mean, so to speak, when you shout it at someone? Yeah. It's more like, aha, <laughs> right? right? Gotcha, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, so in, in, I mean, with this kind of thing, I think the Latin is much more um, precise. Yeah. But, right? We, we, yeah. Just, we're, we're just yelling out adjectives and nouns in English. Right. And we're expecting the listener to fill in all the gaps. Yes. And that's fine if you're a native English speaker. You have all those layers of context and years of experience. But if you don't know it, it must be pretty odd. It, very odd. To have these things, you know, being shouted at you. <laughs> so let me read just a couple lines of Latin here. Okay. Fore so, ut prima luce puellulae puellique omnes laeta politani excitarentur nec ulla mora ad ludicra crepundiaque acipienda festinardent. Tum, di immortales, then, good gods, qui sonatus, qui strepitus, qui crepitus, quales stridordres fragordresque. So that's trying to capture all of those. Noise, 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 noise. That's right. Yeah. So, and then, immortal gods, what sound, what screeching, what clanking, you know, quales stridores fragordresque. Yeah. So. See, now that, that's, I, as a kind of a teaching tool. That's really helpful. It's brilliant. Right? You're yeah. learning all these different names for different kinds of noises. Yes. Whereas Seuss is just saying noise, 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 noise. That's a good point. Yeah. So score one for the Tunbergs? I think so, definitely. All right. Yes. Well, Jeff, uh, we're kind of up against it here. Yeah. We, I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to this what, book. What, are there 40 more pages? <laughs> <This> is, right. <laughs> so we've just, we, what we do, maybe four or five pages here? Yes, we did. We, but, we can maybe come back to it. Uh, but after the break, we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit further afield, yes, right? Right. We're gonna talk and, about um, a number of different books that have been translated to Latin. Yes. And, uh, review them, perhaps. Right. And, yeah. But before we get there, I'd like to read a little bit here at the back of okay. my edition about the translation. Yeah. Now, I'm. I think we've talked before that uh, I'm blessed to know Terence Tunberg. Uh, not not a close friend, but a, a good acquaintance. Where, where is where are he's the at Tunbergs? the University of Kentucky? Okay. Yep, and uh, he's just such a wonderful man, brilliant, brilliant Latinist and as well. And that university um, has a kind of a well-known Latin. It does. Uh, uh, That's right. right. I'm trying to remember the Latin name for it. Well, the the colloquium is the Conventiculum Lexingtoniense, mm. right? Mm -hmm. The Lexington Conventiculum. It's yes. been held many summers for many many years. Uh, but Tunberg and uh, and other fine Latinists, Milena Minkova, they have a um. A, a very well-known MA in Latin, where you can learn to speak Latin like he does. Oh, okay. And like she does. Yeah. But here from the back of the book, Jennifer and Terence Tunberg considered it a creative challenge to render in another language the flawless and seemingly effortless verbal pyrotechnics Theodore Geisel achieved in English. So they just, they saw this, hey, we, this, it was a, a gauntlet thrown down. Yeah, they yep. know. This is tough. Yep. The rich resources of both the Latin language and its tradition down to present times made the challenge particularly welcome to them. Their goal was to produce, whenever possible, effects in Latin equivalent to Seuss English. So recognition that he's got his own particular idiom, yes. right? Their translation is in rhythmic prose, sprinkled liberally with rhyme, repetition, alliteration, colloquialisms, and wordplay. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, shall we go to the break? Let's go to the break. All right. This episode of Odd Nauseam brought to you by Hackett Publishing. For almost 50 years now, Hackett Publishing, based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, have been bringing affordable, uh, approachable, um, uh, digestible translations of the classics. Um, you, know, you know, digestible. Like, okay. You, you give me this funny <laughs> Why look. Why am I looking at you like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's affordable, approachable, digestible. Digestible translations. Of the classics. Of the classics, as well as uh, many other works from all over the, the different um, uh, corners of the humanities. That's correct. Um, and um, I can't say enough about them. Mm -hmm. um, I have a number of translations in my own library. Uh, as we've talked many times, I love the artwork. Yes. Very clever. You've got one in your glove box. I do. In I, case of emergency. Yes. Pull I have, Ovid. I have um, Lamar. Lombardo's uh, 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 Metamorphoses. That's correct. Yeah. You never know if you're going to be stranded in a snowbank, <laughs> in a uh, blustery Michigan evening. That's right. Right? And your last moments, what are you going to do? I went a little grim there, didn't you I? You did. <laughs> you're going to pull Ovid out of the glove box. Exactly. And set it on fire with your cigarette lighter? No. Right. You're going to read it. I tossed out the survival kit. That's right. And I replaced it with the with the tome of, of Ovid. <laughs> I think in our, um, speaking of tomes, I think in our glove box, we have one of those uh, foil blankets. Oh, yeah. That you could either wrap around yourself or use to bake a potato. 
You know that one? <laughs> right, yeah. But what I should have in the glove box is a copy of Ovid. Yeah, exactly. So get rid of that blanket. Okay. Get rid of those two, uh, those two uh, russet potatoes you have in there. <laughs> yeah, I got an assortment of straws, too. <laughs> You have straws in your glove box? I don't. Okay. No, I, I could use some, though. You could use some straws. Yeah. And put a copy of Ovid in there. Maybe the Lombardo translation? Or the Ambrose. Or, are you telling me that Hackett has two different translations they of do. the same classic text? Yeah, it's one of the things I love about this company is that they, um, I mean, many many um, publishing houses that do similar kinds of things, they'll have one translator for yeah, one that's work, right. and we're, they're moving on. We got Plato down. That's it. Boom. Let's go. No, but no. Not, not Hackett. They've got multiple excellent, affordable, beautiful translations of each author. Yes. So, listener, go to HackettPublishing.com, two T's in Hackett. Um, find the, the text that you want. Um, you're going to be there a while because they've got so much to look at. But once you find it, you put your choices into the little gro- grocery uh, satchel. Yes, the grocery satchel. And then what do they type in the coupon code? Well, when you get to the checkout with yep. your little grocery cart with a wobbly wheel, yes, you type in AN, which yeah. is ad nauseum, then you type in 2021. 2021. AN2021. We'll put it right up on the screen here. And what mm-hmm. does that get the listener, Jeff? That gets them two things. They get uh, 20% off really? their entire order and free shipping. That's incredible. Check it out. Yes. This episode is also brought to you by the Moss Method. Jeff, tell us about the Moss Method. I'm not the guy to tell us to tell you about the Moss Method. I was going to ask you. Well, why didn't you then? You well, left it to me. Yeah, what is the Moss Method? Then? The Moss Method is a system that I have developed, a method, you might say, uh, to help you, the listener, the reader, who wants to learn ancient Greek, go from... Uh, neophyte. To to erudite. erudite, yes. That's correct. Can you hold up the mug again? Yes, I'm going to do that part. As you can see here, it is self-paced, expert, and accessible. Maybe you have been told that Greek is hard. Oh, ancient Greek is so difficult. I could never read Plato. Maybe not in that plaintive (laughs) voice. that whiny voice? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Not me. No, the New Testament's (laughs) too hard. No, it's really not. What you need is... A way to approach it. You need someone with experience and a real love for the language. I, I think I'm both of those things. I think so. And go to mossmethod.com. Check out the, the many free instructional videos I have on how to learn Greek. Mm-hmm. And then if you like it, sign up for the course. It's uh, $299. And uh, I teach you everything, not just the, the lexemes and the syntax and the semantics and the grammar, but it's fun. And a couple things I've heard. is, okay. is One is... Uh, the the students that you start reading Greek right away. That's right, the very first day. The very first day, and there's opportunities for our students to get together digitally and to consult with you. That's correct. On every Friday, we have the Moss Method Office Hours, the Moffice Hours, if you will. <laughs> You like that? I do like that. Okay. Yeah. And during the office hours, we talk about anything Greek that you'd like. So last week we had three uh, folks get together. Uh, sometimes we have even more uh, from all over the world. We talked a little bit about the Gospel of Mark for most of the hour. We've looked at Aeschylus before, some Homer, uh, some Plato. It's really quite a smorgasbord. That sounds great. Uh, do this. They go to mossmethod.com. Mossmethod.com, just like it sounds, mm-hmm. and sign up. Sounds great. Check all it out. Right. And this episode also brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ratio Coffee, based in Portland, Oregon, is, uh, I understand it, Mark Helwig. That's correct. And his crack uh, 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 expert coffee team That's out right. there. Um, they've done it. They have. Mark is a devotee of the classics and just an incredible entrepreneur. He said, why should it be the case that in this uh, era of premium coffee, why has the home coffee machine lagged behind? Not only in aesthetics, right? They're, they're kind of ugly. Yes. But also in the quality of the brew they produce. Right. And so he solved both of these problems. He did. Yep. He came up with the Ratio 8, a slick, modern-looking machine. I have one at home on my countertop. It's mm-hmm. a oyster in color with walnut accents. And also the Ratio 6, which you have. I do. It's a beautiful machine. I have the uh, stainless steel. Right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's sleek looking. It's attractive. Um, it's a, it's a pour-over, yes. which, as is the, the 8, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. an automatic pour over. If you've been to one of these froofy coffee shops where they line up all the carafes, then they have the little cone, and then you have a barista there, and they're pouring the hot water carefully into the cone, and you're waiting for it to trickle down. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, that's fine if you want to do that, but wouldn't it be much better to make it at home? It, uh, uh, it is. Yes. Right. And now it's possible. It is. Right. And a press of a button. You go from the 
the bloom stage yes to the brew stage yes to the ready stage that's ready that just like that and it handles all of the details for you that's right so now we have a we have a, a contest we do we where, have a special promo right and we're we're extending this for a, a few more weeks that's correct and um if the listener hangs in there till the end of the episode sometime in the second half they're going to hear a code we're going to drop the secret four digit code and if you take this code to ratio coffee r a t i o coffee dot com slash a n c o mm-hmm. you can enter this special code and you can be entered into the sweepstakes to win your own ratio six yes so stay tuned that's right stay tuned um and but if you want to go shopping at ratiocoffee.com they can pick up a six or an eight yes and uh type in the code a n c o that's right ad nauseum coffee and they get 15 percent off 15 percent off an incredible coffee maker it's uh, won many awards it's been in wired magazine mm-hmm. i understand gwyneth paltrow you what? Know Gwyneth Paltrow? Of course I know who From was. Goop? Goop, yes. That's right. I think she was in those Marvel movies. Yes. Uh, she's purchased some of those. She has? Yes, yes. Wow. They're They're really making a big splash. Man. A lot of different... So if you want to be like Gwyneth, Jeff, <laughs> you are like Gwyneth. <laughs> oh, what am I saying? I, I, am, I am kind of like a little bit like Gwyneth. You're, a little, you're a little bit Gwyneth. Say, who, she, who was she in the Marvel? She was like Pepper Pants or something? <laughs> no, Pepper Pots, Pots sorry. I think. Yes. Coffee Pots, something like that. Right, right. So Gwyneth's got herself a ratio. Okay, yeah, she well, does. There you go. So go to ratiocoffee.com. Check it out. All right, so Jeff, as we get back into it this mm-hmm. evening, we're mm-hmm. going to be looking at Catus Petasatus. Is that where we're going to start up on, on part two here? Yes, okay. well, we really should say Catus, because I'm always laboriously telling my students, it's never ah in Latin, it's always ah. Ah, uh, yes, uh, right. Well, that, that's, it's, it's hard as a Midwesterner. It is. Catus. Yes, yeah, so what do you pick from the tree? Pick from the tree. Apples. Oh, that's right. Apples. As a Midwesterner, you have to sh- shove that A way up in your nasal sinus. Yeah, exactly. Right? What's the plan? It's very uncomfortable. Is, I apologize to the audience right yes. now. Yes. What else do we say in Michigan? Fur. Fur. What's that fur? What's that fur? Right. Exactly. And we also kind of will swallow our teeth. Uh, um, that's not very important. Important. Yeah. <laughs> we put it down in the, yeah. somewhere in the larynx. Yeah. Very glottal. That's so interesting. Are we supposed to say important? Important. It's important to pick the apple. <laughs> the awful from the tree. <laughs> the tree. <laughs> okay, so Catus petasatus. Yes, right. So this is the famous cat in the hat in Latin. Can I read a little bit of the, um, <clears throat> a little bit of the the subtitle here? Yeah. Okay, quid labellus est a doctora sus mm-hmm. primo anglicae compositus. Sound familiar? Yes, but it's exactly the same. It's, it's verbatim as right. what we saw on the Grinch. Yeah. And at nunc quod vix credas in sermonem latinum a Guinevere Thunberg et Terentio Thunberg conversus. Well, it's the tin, it's the Thunbergs again. It is. Yeah. And boy, did they hit this one out of the park. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you want to read a little bit? Yes, here? I think that we should. Okay. You want to read a little bit of the first sure. page there? So, imber totem diem fluit. Urceatum ur semper pluit, tied at intus nos manera, numquum post sol, sol splendera. That's right. So now here, yes. they have, they've kept the ambex and they've, they, they're rhyming it. Yeah, what do we have here? Imber totum diem pluit. So it's, uh, it's four iams, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Each line has eight syllables. Urceatum semper pluit, tied at intus nos manera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the the storm Imber flooded the whole day. So it was it was, it was a raining all that day, right? That's I'm, right. I, I'm I, I'm sorry we don't have the English here, but I'm, yeah, never apologize to the listener. No, just, no. That's right. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Actually, it's always apologize to the listener. <laughs> I we don't, we don't have the English translation, no. and I don't care. <clears throat> right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love this adverb, urkeatim. Okay, what is that? It's I, an never... adverb that means coming down in buckets, bucketly. Bucketly. Bucketly, like a bucket. So it was raining. Cats it was and always dogs. raining cats and dogs. There we go. That's right. Right, right. Tied it into nos manera. It really stunk that we were stuck inside. Num quam potest sol splendera. The, the sun, sun is never able to shine. Yeah, the yeah. sun could never yeah. shine. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Page two? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Take All some. right. Desa des quas sic sedemus, nec rdemus, nec gademus, fora finem quia scendi, mihi space est et sedendi. Oh, I, I love I love the rhyming here. I love the kind of the alliteration, kind yes. of the, the fori finem. They that, nailed that, it, yeah. right? Six sedemus. So uh, lazily decides, so we sat. We didn't laugh, nec rdemus, nec gademus. We weren't happy. Uh, for the finem quia scendi. It was my hope that there would be... In, right, an end of an the end of the, the uh, of the boredom. Or, yeah, or goofing, goofing around, goofing or around, or just yeah. sitting around. Yeah. End of the sitting around. So quiescendi et sedendi. We got two gerunds there. Yes, 
Yeah. You want to take the next uh, sure. stanza? Frigus waitat for us ira, kailam waitat laski wira, domi sumus quiescentes, nil omnino facientes. Yes. That's just fun to read. It is. You yeah. don't have no land to enjoy the that. The cold, the frigus, prevented us from going outdoors. The sky, right, forbade any sense of, I don't know, having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> laski wira. Domi sumus. We were stuck at home with nothing to do. Yeah. Uh, and so we did nothing at all. We did nothing at all, right? Yep. Now, note there, just kind of compared to what we do with the Grinch there, our la- our English translation is much more teased out. Yeah. It's much longer to unpack these very short, uh, compact lines. Definitely. Well, it's, Definitely. It illustrates the, the same thing from the other way mm-hmm. around. Yeah. And it's a brilliant book. So I would say, unlike How the Grinch Stole Christmas, uh, the the Latin in here is still sophisticated, but it is more approachable. Mm-hmm. And there's a nice vocabulary at the back. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, as you know how I like to drop names. Yes. Uh, Terrence Tunberg, you know, good acquaintance. Maybe yeah. we have him on at some point. I don't know if he would hang around with such bums as us. Really? He's such a learned man. Would he just kind of brush us off? I don't, like, I don't know. He yeah. might, right? He's such a learned man. Uh, and Jennifer as well, right? Um, the two of them put this together nicely. Hmm. So, what else are we going to look at this evening, Jeff? Well, um, let's. We've got to. We got to go to the. What I, maybe it's kind of the black sheep of the family here. Yeah. And again, I, I don't speak from personal experience, but um, just doing the little research I did, it seems that this translation of Tolkien's Hobbit, okay, has uh, ruffled a lot of feathers out there. I see you've written down here in our notes lots of anger directed toward this, this one. one. I, I, talking I, about me or the? Oh, just kind of the tenor that I found okay. out there, like in in just um, um, you know, reviews on. Mm. Um, on uh, like Amazon or right. or you know, blog sites, uh, this is not a very popular one. Okay, right. Read some of that anonymous review. Would so you? right. <laughs> uh, this reader wrote: After a second look at the few pages shown, I must strongly advise not to read this horrible barbaric translation. Tell us what you really think. Right. <laughs> a more serious Latinist may just laugh or feel offended a bit, but to a beginner, it may be seriously dangerous. Yeah. So not just bad Latin. It's just it's going to lead you down a dark path. That's correct. Right. Maybe to to be tempted by that one ring uh, that the, sorry, the Tolkien... Oh, know, I get it now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> one bad translation to rule them all. Exactly. In the darkness, bind them. Now you got it. Now okay. you got it. Right, right. So, I mean, one thing I have a problem with, and I have, this is the same with uh, Winnie Illapu, yeah. is that the use of that demonstrative, right? I think we can justify it with Winnie Illapu. We can. I think so. Now, your, your overall point, I'm with you 100%. All right. But I think with the Winnie Illapu, because it's like Alexander Illamagnus, it doesn't mean the, it means the well-known, yes. the famous. Or even that one th- over there. Correct. Yeah. So with Winnie Illapu, I'm with it. You know, uh, Alexander Illamagnus. But Hobbit is Illa? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and and even kind of putting it after the Hobbitus seems like it's very it's, odd. It's a tryhard. I think that Illa Hobbitus would have been okay. It'd have been better, not still not okay. Yeah, but better. So so it's more along the lines of it would be like oh that that famous Hobbit, right? That, Just, well, that well-known Hobbit. What what was the subtitle of the Hobbit? Uh, or there and back again. There and back again. Yes. Now that would have been now of course easy for me to armchair you know, Monday morning quarterback, Mm -hmm. because I didn't translate it and sell it and so forth. And this fellow Mark Walker did, so more power to him. But a better way to entitle it may have been there and back again. I think, uh, to be fair to Mr. Walker, I think in his... I don't want to be fair to Mr. Walker. I do. I'm going to plead his case. In his title, he does have a Latin translation, like the out... we're there and back and return okay. going out and returning um, so but, he has it there but all right. I don't like Hobbitus Illa I mean no. if I was if I was, I would just simply call it Hobbitus that'd or, be okay or however you're gonna mm-hmm. render that well compare it to what the Seuss's did with um, <clears throat> Lychuli right in Lytopoli Florentes yeah there, there is a very Latinate phrase that captures the idea. Right, exactly right. And so it, a lot of the complaints that I read, too, is just that it seemed um, that Mr. Walker just doesn't know his Latin very well. Mm-hmm. He, and it was more like going through a dictionary and picking, oh, that word means whole. Yes. So I'll use the first one that pops up. Yeah, uh, so let's look at that. All right. So... Um, so the the book famously starts out in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Yeah. And he which he translates in foramen terrae habitabat hobbitus. Okay. Right? And so his choice for the word for hold is the the foramen. 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 Right. right. 
Which is a hole that you make with a boring instrument. It's something you would drill in a board. Right. Right. And as we all know, hobbits live in kind of little caves. That's correct. Right. Not in something that you drill with your... Uh, no, no, yeah. no. With your, <laughs> ma- your Makita in a three-eighths inch bit. There you go. Right? There you go. Right, right, right. So, you know, I, it's just really a bad way. The very second word yeah. know, of the translation already indicates to me he doesn't live in a drilled spot <laughs> in a piece of wood. It's a lurking spot. So something like La Tebri. La Tebri would be better. Yeah, what, what did the... the um, <clears throat> The anonymous. Uh, I think he. I mean, this this guy goes on and on about for the forum, and um, I don't. Think we have time to go through all this, but he suggests maybe Kawum, Kawum. something close to like a cave. empty spot, empty right. spot. Antrum. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had Spelunka for the Grinch, right? A Spelunka Tenebrosa, right, from his shadowy cavern. So that doesn't quite capture the notion that it's a warm and cozy place for the little hobbit, right? Whereas La Tebri, my suggestion, uh, does right. Some it's like your layer. It'd right? be it'd be interesting to see what word uh, he uses, like when when you know the hobbit when Bilbo gets to the Lonely Mountain and Smog's lair. Yeah, like what the word there? I mean, <clears throat> hopefully La Tebri. Hopefully, hopefully, right. That's yeah. the, the net. I haven't read the whole work. Yeah. Or even very much of it. Only heard lots of criticisms lots of, of it. Yeah. So we'll let the listener decide okay. for himself. But that one comes with a lot of uh, baggage. Yes. Yeah. So what, yeah. What's the next one? Um. I also out there. Again, I can't. I can't vouch for it. But um, where the wild things are. It's been mm-hmm. translated. Ubi fera sunt. Where yes. the, where the wild beasts are. So ferdra is a neuter plural, right? So it is a good translation of the word things. Mm-hmm. But since these are creatures, unless you're really after the notion that they are not characters. Um, if you're after that notion, you can say ferdra as, you know, inanimate, impersonal, non-thinking, non-acting. Yeah. But ferai, like ferai bestiae, wild creatures, mm-hmm. I think is arguably a little better. Mm. Now, once again, you know, I'm not uh, Rick Lafleur, so mm. it's mm-hmm. easy to armchair quarterback it. Right, right, right. But I do wonder why a neuter plural for ferra here. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know. It, it, it seems like uh, just, I, I mean, I found a couple of, uh, of uh, of uh, quotes from the Latin text, and it seems like he's kind of he's trying to kind of follow uh, Marie Sendak's style, mm-hmm. you know, kind of short and compact. Uh, Mater eus um apala wat ferum. His mother called him wild thing, right? Right. At uh, maximus, that's that's nice for Max. Okay. Dixit comedum te. I will eat you up. Right. Um, and then this this later uh, selection where this is where Max is leaving. Um, the, uh, the the wild things and going sailing back home. Terribilis fremitus fremibant et frendebant dentis terribiles volvebant oculus terribiles terrib- terribilisque unguis monstrabant. Mm. I mean that's that's got a rhythm to it. Yeah, right. They give him some props there. Right. Right. So yeah, they um, they let out terrible roars and they showed their terrible teeth and they rolled right. their terrible eyes and they showed their terrible claws. Yeah. Right. So yeah, a, a little repetitive, but. Yeah. I guess the the original is, is very too. is is repetitive okay. as well, right? So we move on from there, and we're going to look at uh, very very quickly mm-hmm. uh, the two Harry Potter books. I think only the first two have been put into Latin. Yes, and these are um, Harius Potter et Philosophy Lapis, right? And the the Sorcerer's Stone. Now I understand that the original. I'm not a Potterite. Are you a Potterite? Uh, yeah, I've I've read them all with okay. my kids. Yep. The original is the Philosopher's Stone, right? The English, in the, the English, English uh, British edition. Yes. So that's why it's translated Philosophy Lapis. Right. The uh, the American is the Sorcerer's Stone. Yes. So you could have used something like Magi, the genitive of Magus. Yes. You know, a wizard. But I think philosophy is really nice. Yeah. Now this was translated by Peter Needham. Hmm. Uh, now I don't know Peter Needham, uh, but I have his email address. Oh. Yeah. Maybe you get because we have a mutual friend and. Um, Puer qui weeks it is how it begins. The boy who lived. Yeah, or the boy who died. Oh boy, <laughs> right, right. Actually, in, in the in the, in the rolling the word, text, it's 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 he lived. Yeah, yeah but right. I'm saying weeks it, you know, means to die. Right. The perfect of vivo has lived is how you say that someone is dead. Right. So the the famous episode with Cicero, right, coming right. out and, and announcing after they killed the conspirators, weeks it runt. That's they, right. They have lived. They, they're dead. They're dead. <laughs> right. So that's a bit of an odd choice. Okay. A bit of an odd choice, but on the whole. The Latin in here is phenomenal. How so? The boy who lived. I mean, that's a phrase that pops up a lot in this in this mm. book. So how would you have done that in Latin? What would you think would be a better rendering of? Well, that? I would I would probably use an adjective, something like we was right? we was the boy who was still alive, still alive. or maybe even uh, red de we was. I got to check my quantities there. I, don't, I can't remember if it's red de we was, red de vivus, or red de vivus. Doesn't that suggest which, he was which dead and come back, back to life? Come back to life. But isn't that really the idea? Well, I that mean, Voldemort. Uh, oh, sorry, the institution that shall not be mentioned. 
uh, <laughs> failed to kill him. He did, but I mean, but I think it's I mean, kind of the the full death and resurrection thing comes at the very end of the seventh okay. book. But here, so here we was just uh, Voldemort failed to kill him. Okay, well, right. you keep talking because I want please because I want to check the quantity of this particular word. I don't want to mess it up here on air. Okay, you, know, right. you want to be precise. Of course, you right. know me. So one of the things I I wonder about these kinds of books. I mean, this is um, I mean, hats off to. To Mr. Needham, yes. I mean, it just uh, the uh, the accomplishment of this task in and of itself. In what I take to be fairly accurate, very uh, um, uh, erudite Latin, yeah. is a feat in and of itself. But who's reading this? Uh, a lot of people. You think oh, so? Okay, let me rephrase that. Who's buying it? Who's buying it? A lot of people. Right. Who's reading it? Not very many people. Right. This was given to me as a as a gift, yep. and I've used it when, um, you know, back when I taught Latin. I used, for example, you know, for something fun in class. Sure. But it, snippets. Otherwise, it's sat on my shelf. Okay. You know? I've read it. Oh, you have. I've read all of the first one. I haven't read it in English. I've read it in Latin. It's in Latin. Right. I haven't read all of the second one in Latin. Okay. But Peter Needham. Mm-hmm. I'd like to meet him. <laughs> We're back to Seuss. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's Redivivus. Redivivus. Redivivus, okay. Yes, to survive death. Okay. So that's it. That, that'd be better. I, it seems to me. Yeah, you're right. Puer qui weeks it is the boy who died. Yeah, who has lived. Who has finished lived. living. Right, so let's There okay. probably are instances where weeks it can mean survived. Mm-hmm. But my first sense was yours. As Cicero says, weeks erunt. They have lived. They're dead. Yeah. Right, but I, I, um, I mean, I imagine that this book is also filled with lots of neologisms. Well, right. some duff, tough ones, like right on the right in the here. front, we have Hamoxisticus. The, right? Hamoxisticus rapidus is the Hogwarts uh, is the express train. Yes, Hamoxisticus is a very good word for train. Is this uh, a, like a collection of wagons stuck together? Yes, <laughs> it's a, a a word of Greek origin. Yes, right? and you right. have to do that sometimes because it's tough. Yeah, it's yeah, tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the Hamoxosticus rapidus, mm-hmm. Hogwartensis. Right. The Hogwarts Express rapid cart wagon thing. Okay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> now from our friend Justin Bailey. Yes, Justin Bailey. Um, again, a not, fine Latinist. Is he a fine Latinist? He is a yeah. very good Latinist. He, he wrote about this this um, this book on uh, on the website Adelon. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote, never before had I lapped up Latin by the double digits, digits of pages per day. Actual full pages of Latin, uncramped by notes in another language on vocabulary, manuscripts, history, and other things that are often worthwhile and sometimes essential, but also distract from the Latin text. A much adapted dictum about pleasure reading claims that there's no such thing as kids who don't like to read, only ones who haven't found the right book. I already like to read Latin, but Harrius Potter was a gateway text for me, leading, leading to regular sustained sessions reading authors of all eras. Yeah, well said. All right. And that's what uh, Habitusilla was trying to do. But, yes. But uh, I think Needham, you know, maybe better material, starting material. Maybe. Better than Tolkien. No one's going to go for that. No, probably not. No. No. But good good material. Very good material, right? So I guess I probably Needham would read that and say, uh, but yes, it's exactly what I was going for. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, a gateway drug to right. to the heavier stuff. Yeah. Should we read just maybe the opening sentence in Latin here? We got the we book can. here. Yeah. Yeah. Dominus yeah. et domina dursli, qui we webant in aedibus gestationis, ligustrorum numero quatuor signatis, non sine superbia dicebant se rationa ordinaria vivendi, uti neque se pinetere ilius rationis. And so in the um, in Rowling's text, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's um, actually two sentences in Latin, right? Yep. Get down to the ineptias tales, the nonsense. The nonsense, yeah. Needham's done a very nice job with this translation. Yeah. There's a companion volume, right? There is uh, Harrius Potter et Camera Secretorum. Yes. Chamber ne- of Secrets. Needham again? Does, yes. he, does, does he have kind of the, the contract for the I whole think he does. series? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and this is, of course, the uh, Camera, the Chamber Secretorum. Secrets? You could have said something like Arcanorum. Mm. Hidden things or mysteriorum, perhaps. Right. I think I, I, I often thought in doing this kind of thing, just like for fun, I try to avoid kind of the obvious cognitive. Oh, you have to avoid right. the derivatives altogether, yeah, for right. sure. Go with a mondegreen, right? Yeah. Mondegreen. Yes. Yes. I died in the barn tonight. <laughs> in your barn tonight. Uh, but seriously, it could be that he didn't get to pick the title, right? Mm. Someone said, look, we know it's not the best Latin but it looks like Chamber of Secrets is going to sell more. We're going to run with that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's entirely likely. Right. So he had to cave. And that's said, right. Okay. He had to cave. All right. Mm-hmm. Moving on then. What do we have we next? we got to move on. Let's see. Um, I find my notes here. Um, 
Winnie Illa Pooh. Yep. Which, uh, in looking that over, I didn't realize that came out in 1960. It's been around a long time. And it was a bestseller for mm-hmm. 20 weeks on the list. A.A. A. Milne, right? Yep. And uh, translated by Alexander Leonard. And uh, apparently this was, yeah, a massive seller. But again, mm-hmm. 1960, probably, you know, back in the day where... More people reading Latin. M- many more people were having Latin That's as right. the, kind of their expected part mm-hmm. of their education, right? Shall we hear the, the title of the first chapter? Yeah, what do we got there? We have Quo in Capita Nobis Ostentantur Winnie Ilepu Atqua Apes No Nullae Et Incipi Unt Fabulae. And there's some bees about. Yes. yes. This is good Latin. Yeah. In which chapter we are shown, Nobis Ostentantur, mm-hmm. we are shown Winnie the Pooh and some bees, Apes No Nullae, and the stories begin. I got to admit, it doesn't grab me. It's like, you know, here's a story. Here's some bees. But have you ever enjoyed Winnie the Pooh? No, I had never did. Like I that. haven't either. Yeah, it's it's just, a little too Curious Georgie for me. It, it, yeah, it's a lot of lot of sighing and, oh, bother. Right, and right. a lot of Eeyore traipsing around. Yeah, exactly. Where's the action? Yeah, and Tigger just... Just tamp it down a bit. Yeah, I, w- <laughs> <laughs> I want Winnie the Pooh coming down with like a red shield that looks like a kind of a snow saucer, you know, and maybe a cape and a hammer and something. You catching my drift? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe Winnie turns green if he eats too much honey and starts <laughs> smashing through the 100 acre forest. You want a little bit more action? I do little, want some okay. action. <laughs> exactly. It's a little, it's it a little is. too dull. Yeah, not much happens, right? In this in this chapter one, what what's happens? There's some bees. Some bees. Have we alienated uh, all the audience now? Here's some excellent Latin, though. Let okay. me just read. Right. Nomen audiens primum sicur vos dictur riestis etiam ego dixi. Uh, listening to the first name, as though you were about to say it, I also said, credidi eum puerum esse. I believed that he was a boy. Hmm. It's good Latin. It's good Latin. It's well put together. It's very idiomatic. The phrasing and the word order, the syntax, it's very good Latin. Very cool. Um, next up, we have uh, uh, Alicia Intera Mirabili. Mm-hmm. And you have, a, you have the text there. Too. I do. Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Jeff, you have a story behind well, this text, Well, I, right? I once, I, I, I found this or it was sent, sent to me and I thought, oh, this would be fun to use as kind of a secondary... Friday afternoon text in in, mm-hmm. in Latin and uh, in the second year of Latin class. It did not work very well for no. me. It was more, be, I think, because um, um, what I discovered was my students just didn't know the story okay. that well. It's it's just not as it's not as still out there in the vernacular as, as, as I thought it might be. It's kind of like Shakespeare, right? A little Every, bit. Everybody knows about Shakespeare, and you know certain words and phrases, like going down the rabbit hole. And, yes. Uh, this is not Jabberwocky, is it? No, it's same author, different, same, different right, thing. Okay, and then people know, but about they the, don't really know the plot, right? They know about the Cheshire Cat and right. his grin stays there, but they don't know the story very well. So, yes. So I was excited about it because it was a story that I grew up in, and read uh, many times and loved. Uh, but my students said, "Oh yeah, okay. kind of know Whatever. that." So it did not work very well as as an in class yeah. text. But. So this is 1964, St. Martin's Press. So mm. same as the Winnie Illapu, maybe inspired by the success of. Apes non nullae. Possibly. Some bees. Some bees. <laughs> Let me read the title page. Right. Ludoviki Carol, Liber Notissimus Primum Abhinc, Anis Centum Editus, Alicia in Terra Mirabili, Latine Reditus, Abeus Fautora, Vetera Gratoque, Clive Harcourt Carruthers. So he translated it. Yes. Right. A very well known book, Liber Notissimus, um, published almost 100 years ago, it says. And now translated into Latin by Carruthers. How did, how did they render, uh, was it Ludovicus for Lewis? That's Lewis. Yeah. Lewis, okay. And that's pretty standard. Okay. Yeah, that's, that exists um, in very old texts, okay. Ludovicus. Hey, we got to move along because we're yeah, running out of well, time, aren't we? I think what we're going to have to do, sadly, is we're just going to have to cut back here. We went too long with the Lytopoli, the Lytuli and Lytopoli Florentes at the beginning. Yeah, I think it was worth it. It was worth it, worth it but we're going to have to do a, a... I think we're going to have to do a follow-up a follow- episode. At some point, yeah. We have to at least tell the uh, audience who Walter Conison Flantis is. Who's that? It's Walter the... Um, <laughs> oh, can I say it on air? Of course you can. Walter the farting dog. <laughs> That's Walter Connus in Flatus. <laughs> so that one made the cut? That, uh, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and and you the, have it in the pile Well, there, it's right? not that I, it yeah. made the cut. It's yeah, that it? we said earlier in the episode that oh. we would tell them what it meant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so I, it's not that I want to deal with it now, <laughs> so to speak. But So William Kotzwinkel and Glenn Murray, Walter Connus in Flatus, Picturis ab Audrey Coleman Colatis, mm-hmm. In Sermonum Latinum ab Roberto Dobbin Conursus. Well, a lot of people involved in this. Uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and the dog. So Bob Dobbin. 
Bob Dobbin. Roberto Dobbin. He tra- Robert Dobbin or Bob Dobbin, Bob as Dobbin. I like to call him. Yep. I uh, translated it in Sermonum Latinum into the Latin language. So there you go. Walter Canis Inflatus. Mm-hmm. Right. So I guess uh, Charlotte's Web and Arbor Alma and the eggs are green, the ham is green. Mm-hmm. And uh, one that I authored. What? You you wrote a book? Oh, yeah. What have we got here? Well, let's put it up on the screen. Right. Trace Moray's Kaiki. There we go. Three blind mice. Three blind mice. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to deal with these in uh, another episode. We will. I'd love to hear the story behind that. All right. And how that came to be. Yeah. yeah and we can, I, I'd love to, to think about, you know, what, what, what books are out there that should be translated into Latin. Right? Yes. I've, yeah. I've given that some thought, as have a lot of other people, of course. Sure. And uh, there's, there's a definite, uh, definitely some good questions. Excellent. But we got to get out of here. All right. So... Listeners, uh, as always, uh, we'd love to give, uh, have you give us a nice review yes. on whatever platform you listen on. That really Send us an email. Send us an email, uh, dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or jeff at adnauseum.com. Remember that V, ad nauseum, you might say. Yes, but um, yeah, if you want a shout out, if you got an idea, uh, leave a review um, that uh, that really helps us out. We, That's and, right. And we love it. And we need to say some thank yous as well. Yes. Uh, we want to thank our sound engineer. Yep. Uh, Mishka, Mishka puts has, this together so nicely. As always, yeah. We want to sh- uh, thank Agricola. Agricola, yeah. Our uh, video guy. Yep. Uh, to uh, Ken Tamplin and Scott Vincent for the great music. And, yeah. and this week, Mr. Jeff Sheets. Mr. Jeff Sheets, yeah. Yeah. Guitarist extraordinaire from um, the, the Kansas City area. Who's Fabulous. providing some wonderful themed seasonal music for us. Yes. And Dave, what we got going on next week? Well, I think we're going to talk about uh, Lord Elgin yes. and the Parthenon sculptures. Yeah. And you're, you're going to helm this one, right? I'm very excited about that. I just finished a wonderful book on this whole okay. controversy. And, it's and going to get down to fisticuffs? I don't think so. I'm uh, going to say, I think the British should keep them. And you're going to say, no way. No way. Okay, it might come to fisticuffs. And the, okay. I think that's going to split on those. But I learned a lot more about this guy's story. And okay. um, it's it's changed my views in some so ways. So you yes. developed a little bit of sympathy for Lord Elgin? Um, Yes and no. Okay. But we'll talk about that next time. All right. That'll yeah. be episode number 70. Whoa, man. Yeah, the Septuagesimal episode. Where do the, where does the time go? Right. And Jeff, yes. I believe you have our dessert this evening, yes. don't you? The gustatory parting shot. Yes. This comes from humorist PJ O'Rourke, who said, a fruit is a vegetable with looks and money. Plus, if you let fruit rot, it turns into wine, something Brussels sprouts <laughs> never do. Good stuff. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot.